Hi, folks. It's Voss here from TheResistanceRadio.com. Viva la resistance! Resist, if you will. Uh, hashtag. Hashtag resist. Hey, guys. Welcome to the podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in to The Resistance. Uh, and, of course, the Chris Voss Podcast Network. You can go to ChrisVossPodcastNetwork.com and TheCVPN.com or youtube.com for slash Chris Voss. If you're listening on the audio version of our podcast, which they all are, you can see the video of this on YouTube and uh, the wonderful guests we have here today. So uh, be sure to do that. Also go to tubebuddy.com for slash Chris Voss. You can uh, subscribe to that and uh, get all sorts of really cool stuff to make all sorts of money on YouTube. Anyway, moving on, we have been interviewing a ton of different candidates that are running for office coming up in November 2020. These are going to be the people that help us get through the uh, what will be probably one of the most darkest recessions, depressions, eras in our history. So uh, you want to think really hard about the people you elect and the people you put in office because these are going to the people we're going to really be relying on to help help us out, maybe bail us out as we go through these times. So this is a uh, one of the most consequential elections coming up here. Uh, this is Lynette Wendell, who's going to be with us. She's running for the Utah House of Representatives. She's originally from the Chicagoland area. Lynette received her BA in psychology from Eastern Illinois University. And then with the backpack at less than $10 a day, she spent several years circumventing the globe before becoming a Utah resident in 1995. Lynette has a rich professional history in education and conflict resolution, spanning more than two decades. Uh, equally dedicated to public service, she has an extensive 15-year voluntary resume in community planning, education, public safety, animal welfare, and environmental sustainability. She's built for office. Uh, Lynette, dis Lynette's decision to run for office is founded on improving conditions for everyone in our community, She's respected as a nonpartisan leader for her ability to include all stakeholders and facilitate productive dialogue in a civil and respective manner. Lynette will also close the existing divide between our community's priorities and current legislative policy. Welcome to the show. How are you doing, Lynette? Great, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming on the show. And we have you, you're representing Utah House District 39, which yes. is, I believe, Taylorsville and Kearns in the state of Utah, and we actually had uh, uh, your neighbor on the show, who I think is, I'm losing track, we've interviewed a bunch of people, I think she, was yeah. she 30, 38 district? Uh, yeah, Ashley Matthews. Uh -huh. Ashley Matthews, so this yep. is going to be awesome. So give people your dot .com so people can check there, go support them, help us flip Utah blue. Yeah, my website is boat Lynette, L Y N E T T E dot com. And you can catch me at uh, Facebook at boat Lynette and Twitter and Instagram, boat Lynette. Vote Lynette.com. Mm -hmm. You can support her there, or you can donate your time. You can volunteer. Uh, these folks need a lot of help. And I know one of the challenges with Utah is it's usually been predominantly a red state, but I think this is a good year. I'd put my money on this year. Uh, of anything because I think there's going to be a lot of monumental change both to our economy, our lifestyles. Uh, all politics are local, but I think at the federal level, we definitely have some issues and some change coming up there. I uh, hope so. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. But Utah's had 40 years of rule under the GOP uh, gubernatorial governors. And uh, I think it's time for change, and I want to see um, fresh faces, new voices, more women in politics as well. As everyone knows, I'm a big support of, of getting more women in politics and getting more people who look like the broad spectrum of the population of America and Utah. So, uh, Lynette, tell us a little bit about you, your origin story, where you came from, and how you got here. Yeah, well, like you said, Chris, I'm originally from the Midwest. I'm from a suburb, a, a working class suburb just outside of Chicago. Uh, you know, grew up with a very small but very connected family. Unlike these Utah families or my husband's family, which tend to run quite large, my uh, extended family is the size of most immediate families <laughs> in Utah. Um, but what we share in common is in the Midwest, I think the reason why we see so many Midwesterners uh, transplanting and being so successful in Utah is because our sense of neighborliness, community service, um, that idea of taking care of each other uh, and, and service is just such a, a critical component to how I grew up. 
And I grew up with a single mom. My father died uh, when I was relatively young, who, you know, my mom had to work full time and part time. My grandmother helped support us. And I was the first and still only college graduate in my family. So even though I feel extremely fortunate to have had those opportunities made available to me and have been able to maximize them, I, I certainly remember the early days. Um, my husband as well also came from a working class family in Texas when we first got married and spending uh, 70 cents on a big gulp was a budget problem in our wow. house. And wow. we would have to have conversations about that. But over the years, we have um, grown into our careers and have been extremely fortunate. And um, part of that good fortune allows us to really pay back in our community in a way that we understand um, what it is like every day to be looking at your budget, how to care for your family, how to work hard, and still have those quality of life elements that are important to you. So um, moving to Utah 25 years ago felt like a real natural transition for both of us. And we specifically chose the west side of Salt Lake because for us, uh, working class families, uh, having diverse people of religious and ethnic diversity was extremely important. And uh, Utah wasn't quite known for those elements at that time. So seeking them out and knowing now that we flourish with these beautiful, diverse communities um, that still have those same values, you know, of taking care of each other, working hard, looking for upward mobility and environmental sustainability nobody comes to Utah because they dislike the outdoors right so preserving <laughs> preserving these beautiful spaces quality of life and that multi-generational component that we want to have in our families um, is a top priority for me yeah and it's good family state uh, you know everywhere I've traveled in the world when people hear that I I spent some years in Utah uh, they're like that, that state's beautiful they're the parks the skiing like they it's kind of funny they don't know much about utah other than that they know about the church and they know about but they mostly know about the parks and the skiing and just they're just like it's so beautiful yeah and uh I think they think the whole state is like a giant national park. I'm pretty sure. Well, it is. We have Technically, five yeah, national yeah. parks, which is yeah. more than any other state. So yeah. when you think of, you know, other amazing locations like Alaska, knowing that we have five national parks in Utah, um, yeah. it's pretty impressive. Not to mention our state parks, a lot of them would be national parks if they were in other areas. Definitely. I mean, in such beautiful, such beautiful uh, things. And then anybody who skis goes crazy about the state. Right. I love to ski. Uh, so uh, that's awesome sauce. So you've been here for a long time. Long time. And, Longer uh, than I've lived anywhere else. Well, there you go. There you right. go. Uh, and so what made you uh, kind of reach this point where you're like, I should get into politics because you're new at this. Is this your first yeah. run for office? First run for office, not new to government um, yeah. in the sense that I'm a planning commissioner in Taylorsville and have been for five oh, years. Okay. Um, I've been a really uh, over the top, I guess you can say, a personality with my volunteerism over the past 15 years. I've had the pleasure of giving more than 18,000 volunteer hours in our community in a variety of capacities like you talked about in the intro. And a lot of that community advocacy work um, and my passion for our community has led me into uh, nonprofit groups, community uh, organizations, into our schools every day, our senior centers, certainly government meetings, uh, both at the city, county, and state level. And I found my la the last few years, I was spending a lot of time up at the Capitol, whether that be during our interim sessions for committee hearings to hear about what would be happening in our general session, or spending an incredible amount of time uh, up at the Capitol during the general session. And it was with the blatant disregard of what our community voices were saying when I saw it didn't matter what propositions we had, what referendums, uh, our citizens were spending their time, money, and energy on to get their voices heard, they were being completely disregarded. Wow. And as a mediator by profession, uh, I believe that there's a tremendous opportunity to get those voices to Capitol Hill and find the solutions that are sensible, that are pragmatic, 
but that definitely reflect the needs of the community. And you were mentioning that a lot in the beginning, Chris, actually, is talking about this desire for people to feel represented. And uh, when I would go and try to advocate on behalf of my neighbors and friends in the community, and nobody had a sense of the same story that I was getting uh, in the schools and community centers and driveways, <laughs> churches, wherever we would be talking, I thought, you know, something here really needs to change. And no matter how hard I worked at educating and advocating, um, nothing was, was still happening. So I thought the only way that that was going to change is if we started changing who was making those decisions. And uh, somehow, nine months later, here I am <laughs> and go. having the time of my life serving our community. That's awesome, Sauce. So now you're running for office. This is, uh, I, I don't know about you, but to me, it would be daunting to run for office. And uh, maybe I've just watched too many uh, political fights at the federal level. I think everything, everything seems to be a little nicer in the state level. Um, but uh, you guys don't have any knockdown, drag out debates or anything like that uh, that you guys seem to have. But uh, you, don't have a, you don't have someone rage treating you from the White House if they don't like you. But uh, I think this is great that you're doing this. You're getting involved. Uh, your opponent has been an incumbent for, I think you said, uh, almost 20 years. Yeah, I'll be the tenth race, legislative race for my, for the incumbent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so it's time to mix it up, bring some fresh faces in, some fresh ideas, uh, people that uh, you know are hungry. I'm a big believer in people that are hungry, that want to see change, that have their finger on the pulse. Uh, you know, uh, I know a lot of stuff. After 20 years, I'm just phoning it in. I'm phoning this podcast in right now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I haven't been doing the podcast for 15 years, but no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I think I'm phoning in the rest of my life, though. I'll have to check with my psychiatrist. Uh, yeah, check but it out. <laughs> check it out. So, what are some of the things that you think are important? You represent. You're going to be representing Kearns and Taylorsville, Taylorsville if you win in House District 39. And uh, what are some of the things that you want to try and change? What What's some agenda items that you have on your plate? Yeah, you know, um, specifically, like I was talking about living on the west side. I'm from the gritty south side of Chicago when we were talking about working class families and diversity and respecting each other and taking care of each other. And that's what attracted me to the west side here. The west side, however, um, has had its, its misfortune from the perspective of equitable access to health care and education, our health disparities and health outcomes, especially in the current segment of my district, are abysmal. And I need to be in a position, again, to bridge those gaps between the needs of the folks in my community and the decision makers and resources that exist at the state level. COVID has only made this yeah. so much more apparent, right? So all of us who've lived in these disparities for decades um, and generations know that they were there. And through a good economy and no pandemic, people could work their two and three jobs and uh, you know have a life expectancy that's five years less than the wow. rest of the state average have some of the highest diabetes rates, have one of the highest infant mortality rates, have no internet access at home because they weren't having to be schooled at home, and they could fly below the radar. Well, COVID came, and within the first 48 hours, I had to go back to doing what I know how to do, which is serving our community. Mm -hmm. So I organized my campaign volunteers early, and thankfully, I have well over 100 of them. I have a, an army nice. of volunteers. An Paybacks army. for a volunteer are great. Uh, I encourage anybody who volunteers to realize the amazing network they're creating for themselves. Mm -hmm. But immediately, we immobilized, uh, or mobilized, not immobilized. We mobilized those uh, volunteers and created a community check-in program, and we've made over 3,000 phone calls to our neighbors uh, where we've been able to connect those who can help to the opportunities to volunteer and donate in our community, and those who needed resources, we connected them to resources. And what I know is over these past couple of months, the pain hasn't been quite as uh, poignant as I believe it's going to be in the coming three to six months. Yeah. So when we would ask that beautiful forward question, how are you doing? 
most people were just so receptive to the fact that anybody was even checking on them in the first place. And we were able to build this amazing uh, collaboration with folks in the community. All 13 principals in my schools in my district have worked with me, our police chief, our churches, uh, other community leaders, where we were able to bring food to refugee families, collect hand sanitizer for our police department, hand out printed packets to our elementary school kids who have no internet access. But what I know, and I'm sorry, taking a lot of time to talk no, about it, Chris. No, you're but fine. This is what, what we want. I, <laughs> People want to know what, what are you, what yeah. are you stand for? Yeah, yeah. But what I do know is what felt like cracks in the road before for our families are now like gigantic crevasses and glaciers, right? They're mm -hmm. just falling into these holes. And um, again, you know, I don't, and I have two, I have such a diverse district. Like I said, I have a lot of people in my district who've experienced no peril in this whatsoever. They shifted to working at home. They had internet access. They had tutors. They had help for their kids. They had their groceries delivered. Um, never missed a step in, in this process. And I'm grateful for those folks because they're going to be the ones who are going to help us get all that upward mobility we need for the rest of them. And uh, that's why I'm running. That's, that's what I've awesome. seen. And I can't wait to get, to, well, I'm already been working 12 to 15 hours a day. So let's just go to 17 hours if we have to. This is awesome. And we need people like you in, in the coming times. Uh, the economy's uh, set not to recover until the end of 22 by even, you know, the CEO of Bank of America, if you don't want to take my word for it. Uh, we're going to go through some more deeper troughs, as you mentioned. Uh, we may go through some second and third rebound. Uh, rounds or whatever you want to call them, waves. Uh, certainly a lot of states in the south are seeing the reopening. Uh, we're actually staying still pretty high and steady. And it seems like the general public is just kind of over it, not wearing masks. I'm still amazed at how much I go out and there's little to no masks. Um, you know, for me, I really love my mom uh, and I want to I wanna keep her. She'll live to 100 the way she's going. Uh, I want to keep her around. Uh, my two sisters are in care centers, so I, you know, every day we've got uh, COVID-19 stocking outside their place. And so I, I'm a real big believer in, you know, wearing my mask, my gloves, and making sure I don't spread this virus. But you bring up a really good point. Uh, this is one of the, some of the different things that are going to happen in this world is a lot of these kids are going to need to be educated over the internet. Uh, I don't know how long that's going to go for or how soon schools will be able to open, but kids and families not being able to access the internet right now, I, I can't imagine that. Um, yeah, definitely, Chris. You know, in our state, uh, about a month ago, we had estimates that in Utah, 20% of the kids statewide had not accessed their online learning. When I talked to the teachers and principals in my district in particular, we assume that that's going to be more like a 30 to 40% number. So that means we have about 30 to 40% of our kids who lost nearly half of their school year um, by not having those resources available to them. So the, the trickle down effect of what's going to happen for this next school year, whatever that may look like, right, since we still don't know what that may look like, is going to have a significant impact uh, regardless. But and and we're going to go through a lot of different other things. There's people that feel they have PTSD out of this. I'm not sure if I'm fully there, but I definitely, I think it's set to, to, to put a chink in the old depression uh, and not in a good way. Uh, and there's a lot of domestic violence that we're seeing around the nation that's on the rise. I'm sure, I'm, I doubt there's any zip code in America that's devoid of that. Uh, children, like you say, but between health, there's a lot of kids who are going to school just to get something to eat because they came from poor families. And um, so now they can't get to school. They don't have access to internet, which is really important. Uh, a lot of our models are going to be up in people between education and everything else. And we're going to need smart, willing, hungry people to get us through that. People that can get down, roll up their sleeves, get down on their knees and help work through all these different things that are going to go on because we're going to be looking more and more to our government. Like a lot of people are just like, yeah, well, I don't know, we vote for them and they go do whatever and I don't know, I just do my job. But we're going to be asking the government, I think, for a lot more help um, and a lot more resources and everything else. And, I th and hopefully we're going to all more and more come together. Uh, but like you say, this, this virus uh, nationwide has just opened up so many crevasses uh, even wider between healthcare, between childcare, uh, between education, 
between uh, domestic issues, um, just everything that everything that we had issues with, including probably infrastructure for that matter, just everything that we were kind of slumming it by, just getting by on, is now really getting magnified. And um, and this and it's not going away. I mean, it's it's going to be around with us for a while. And uh, it's going to be constantly stalking. And it's, it's not a fun disease. And the more we find out about it, the more horrified we are. Like, the more I just read about this disease, the more I just go, I don't want any, I don't even ever want to get it. Like, I don't care if there's a vaccine. I don't ever want to get it. That's just it. But uh, so you're, you're working through a lot of different stuff. People can go to your website at votelinette.com and they can donate, they can volunteer. They can see some of your media. They can get to know you better on your issues, figure out ways to get involved, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you got two beautiful dogs, I should mention, on your website. I'm a, I have two Siberian Huskies, so. Do you? Yeah, oh, yeah. We ha- In our first generation, we had a Samoyed rescue oh, yeah. that's beautiful. So, yeah, those Arctic breeds are beautiful animals. Yeah, that's why I'm covered in hair most times during the show. <laughs> I actually have to take a, take one of these little roller things and roll the hair oh, off yes. of the show. And yes. uh, even then, I, there's no way to get it all off. You just I'm sure 3M hair. is appreciative of your patronage. <laughs> yeah, I'm probably, <laughs> the keeping, roller. Them, I'm probably <laughs> keeping them in business, between them and mass. So um, it, the next year or two is going to be a challenging year. And so I, I've implored people as we've been doing these shows with uh, local politicians, we're going to keep doing them right up until the election. I keep imploring people really think hard about the uh, voting that you're doing. And uh, I know I, I'm a big, per, I'm, I'm a big uh, supporter of women in office, and I'll tell you why, and, and I, probably people are tired of me talking about this in the show, but it's important because maybe no one will watch the other ones. Um, they're not like that, that person in my district, so I'm not watching that show. Uh, but, uh, but here, I come from Vegas, and in Vegas I made this big deal about how I'm just going to vote straight ticket women. I'm like, I'm tired of seeing a bunch of white, rich guys, and I'm one, so I know I'm kicking the country club, and I'm tired of seeing them all in Congress just making money, starting wars. I go, I want women in office. Women have empathy. They care about children. They care about the future of their children, their grandchildren. You know, guys are kind of stupid, so that's just my opinion. Uh, and women have just a whole different aspect of how they do stuff. And, uh, if you can find a woman who started a war, well then good luck. Uh, <laughs> so I always hear that all the time. Women will start a war. Uh, mostly haven't men started most wars. Uh, in fact, all of them. Uh, but, uh, so we, uh, put into Las Vegas in, in Nevada, that is, uh, the largest legislature of women. And yep. I voted just everybody is a woman down the ticket, unless they were GOP. I didn't vote for them, but uh, everybody is a woman down the ticket. I voted for straight women, and we put in office all women, uh, mostly women. And I got to tell you, they, they are doing. If you get a chance, and you don't believe me, uh, Google it, research it. They are doing stuff for childcare, healthcare. They are doing all the good stuff for the future of this country, laying uh, laying a groundwork for good stuff. And they haven't started yes. any wars yet in Nevada, so that's probably good. I've, I've been watching. It's an exciting <laughs> time for any female candidate. Yep. Um, you know, in Utah, women's issues are particularly important. Mm-hmm. We still have the largest wage gap in the state. Yes. Um, we still only have 23% of our elected officials are females. And what we know about women is we put them in control of our households and the most critical elements of our lives, right? Raising children and supporting families and defining morals for people. Um, And we're fantastic HR directors. Like I said, my campaign allows me to tap into the best people who are already solving these problems in our community. I don't have to sit there and try to recreate the wheel. I call, you know, Principal Holt when I need to know what's going on here. And I call Principal Lou there. And I call Chief Tracy Wyant, you know, in our police department. So, you know, this is about us as a community already taking care of these frontline problems that we have and then getting the support of the state to to help us facilitate those problems at the front line extinguish them at their smallest point we don't want to wait for them to be ablaze we want to neutralize those situations as soon as we see that they're going to have a negative impact in our community and the thousands of people that are doing great work in taylorsville and kearns every day 
you're going to get me emotional about it, Chris, but <laughs> I tend to get emotional every right. time I talk about it is the privilege of serving alongside these people, not in some above capacity or um, some arrogant capacity. And, and certainly I have a tremendous amount of life experience that, like you said, qualifies me for this role, but it's still in an alongside fashion with my neighbors. And because uh, that's where the work is being done, quite mm -hmm. honestly. And women can multitask like nobody else. <laughs> But even then, I, I am I am for change, and uh, I love to see the state get a lot more stuff going on. I love to see better investment in education here. Uh, I think Chris Peterson, when he was on, stated that you guys are last in education in the state. We have been for pretty much all 25 years that wow. I've been here. Um, and again, you know, we want to talk about what our goals are. I was a center director for Sylvan Learning Center for many years. So education mm. is a real passion of mine. And when parents would come in with their kids, I would always say, well, you know what? Here, we do not lower expectations. We increase performance. And that's my motto in life is we should never lower our expectations, always use our resources to increase performance. And uh, education, no doubt, needs that the most. As a state, we actually have legislation that says our literacy rate, our goal is for third graders to have 60% of them, only 60% of them be reading at grade level um, in third grade. And I think, wow, that's a failing grade at any time. So if that is our bar, and, and this is the worst part of it, we're not even achieving that. We haven't even gotten to the 60% yet of our third graders reading at grade level. So again, my opportunity and working with educators and families the way that I have, I know that that's a very achievable goal. We have to just go back to our front lines and support these people doing the work that they do so well. But yeah, no more lowering standards. That's, that's ridiculous. Yeah, and, and what, that, that just amazes me because this is such a family state. Utah has almost one child more than per family than any other state in the nation. You would think that education and raising kids uh, to be really smart. You guys have a good sort of Silicon Valley branch off here. Um, and, uh, you know, it's funny. 41 years ago, I grew up in California. I went to school. We learned to read and write in kindergarten. I think second grade, we were doing calligraphy. And wow. in fourth grade, we were doing stop animation films and writing prose and poetry and stuff like that. But we were doing yeah. films. Like, I don't know what they're preparing us for, Hollywood or something. But we were doing <laughs> films in fourth grade. And then uh, a few Special years Special interest there? Is that what you're talking about? Chris? I don't know. Special I don't interest. know. I was like, what do, you, what do you want me to be? Spielberg or something? Like, I don't, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, a, it was a really amazing time. And then I moved to Utah in my later years. And I was like two to three years ahead of people in the school. And I was, I slummed the, like for two to three years, in fact, I slummed the rest of school because of it. But I, I was two or three years and I'm just like, I already learned all this crap. This teacher's teaching me. I don't even know what, I'm just looking around going, whatever. And when I did graduate from American Park High, um, the, uh, I was amazed at how many of my friends couldn't read or write. Like they were, they were almost illiterate. I mean, I would read the stuff they would write on a page and I'd just be like, how did you get your degree to graduate from high school? I mean, yeah. I barely graduated, but it was kind of on purpose. Um, but no, they were, they were, they were awful at, at stuff. And so I'm surprised that 40 years later, that's still going on. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, you know, and to talk about the Utahns, they really do prioritize education, the sense that it's still over 50% of our state's budget goes mm -hmm. to education. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that's just not enough, like you said, based on the number of kids that we have. And mm -hmm. really, again, going back to where is the efficiency, where are the successes, and um, addressing those those issues at the simplest level first. Um, you can't just always throw a Band-Aid over something, You like trying to cover the symptoms. Uh, we have to get to the actual problem. And we know what those are. Believe it or not, yeah. we do know what those are well, and the, we can correct them. Over 20 years, I've known educators and I would talk to them, uh, someone related to me, and, they, and, they, and I, they'd be like, yeah, I just went to the store and spent 250 bucks on, uh, on supplies. They're elementary school teachers. And I'm like, right. so that's a lot of money. What do you, 
what the hell are you teaching those kids? I don't know, you know, I don't know kids. Uh, but, uh, you know, I had to buy like paper and, you know, they tell me about it and I'd be like, so you get reimbursed for that, right? No, this is my own money. And I'd be like, <laughs> and yeah, I, they were spending like close to $200 a month because they cared. They love their kids so much and right. stuff. And then I would hear about the, the, the constant increases over the last 20 years of their child size. They would go from like 20 students and then 25, 30, 35, 40. And then they would start having these crazy class sizes where they couldn't even, you know, you, there's a certain point where you have a mob of children that are uncontrollable. Sure. I mean, sure. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's absolutely. just a point where it just becomes a herd that's, you know, you're just like, there's, I don't know. And then of course you can't really teach each child and, help each child and children that need help that are falling behind. You can't help them. And then, you know, meanwhile, you got kids swinging from the uh, ceiling fans or something. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> or worse. <laughs> or worse. So anything more we need to know about you and what you're doing for Utah House District 39? Um, I, I think it's just the fact that this is a, a pretty unique campaign that we have organized. It is completely focused on community service. And we know as long as our mission is always that it's less about us and more about you, uh, we'll be serving our community well. And I really appreciate everybody's support. Our volunteer team is worth tens of thousands of dollars in mm -hmm. workforce, remarkable. And we need all the help we can get because as I said, we are connecting with people one-on-one -on -one in the community. We're not uh, trying to just be generic in our messaging. We wanna make sure we're hearing from people and what their stories are. And then of course, there is that dollar amount and this isn't a time that's good for a lot of folks and I get that. So what we wanna make sure that we do is that we stay very effective with uh, what we do with our funds and that's why our workforce uh, you know, when people talk like a three to one match, we're about a hundred to a one match mm. um, in our fundraising abilities with our workforce. And, uh, but if somebody has the opportunity, every $5 buys us 10 handwritten postcards, right? Oh, That's wow. 10 more people we connect with in that personal level. So we appreciate uh, everything people can do for us. And if now isn't the best time, hopefully we'll see some improvement in weeks or months to come as much as we are concerned. Hopefully that improvement is there and people will keep us in mind uh, in those weeks and months to come as things get better for them. And I, and I do believe we're going to be tapping in the resources, so it's probably a good investment in the future. Uh, the resources we go through, I saw, uh, I saw these crazy food lines. Uh, where did I see those uh, in the newspaper where they just basically shut down a freeway somewhere back east? I want to say Vermont. Yes, Vermont. And they basically shut down a freeway and this line went for miles of people and they have these big food trucks. They parked on the other side of the freeway and they're just serving in the medium. And they're just filling people's trucks. And I'm just looking at going like, this looks like Russia did during the USSR. You right. know, when I remember growing up in the eighties, you see the bread lines and the people. The bread line. And, um, and I'm just like, this is crazy. And we're not even through the worst of it yet. I mean, there's bankruptcies right. coming. There's more layoffs coming. Uh, I've had people say to me here in Utah, well, you know, Utah, we're kind of not, you know, we went on those big companies like New York, but we actually do. You guys have Adobe and a bunch of companies and uh, a rising tide lifts all boats and a sinking tide takes all boats down. And so uh, I think there's tough times ahead. Uh, we're going to have to get through it, not only at the local level. So you're going to need to uh, know your local people, help them out, make the investment now, especially if maybe you have the time and money to put into it. Uh, or you can volunteer uh, you know, uh, help that blue wave out, get out, share the, share the information, let people know. Uh, it's kind of a tough time where you guys can't be out door knocking, shaking hands and kissing babies. So, but, uh, that kind of makes it easier for a lot of people to help out. They can share, they can contact, they can email, um, they can do zoom meetings. I think, I think Chris Peterson and, uh, Lieutenant governor with him, uh, they're doing like zoom meetings to groups of people. They're like, Hey, give us a, group of people you want us to meet you and your friends put them in yep, front of the camera exactly that's so what we're doing yeah that's our new big kissing baby thing i guess you can you can kiss the screen you won't uh do covid <laughs> and stuff so and the nice thing is you don't have to wear a mask when you zoom either so that's nice um so anyway guys uh be sure to check uh lynette out uh lynette wendell the utah house district 39 you can go to vote lynette.com you can see all the wonderful things he's 
do there. You can donate to her campaign. You can volunteer to help her out. Bring some change to Utah. Freshen it up. Uh, I've been I've been talking to a lot of people, the Democrats, saying, let's turn the state blue. And then, like, you know what, Chris? We're really happy if we could just turn it purple. purple. And we want to get along with everybody. And I love how everyone, you know, wants to get along, wants to help each other out, wants to work, wants to meet in the middle. And, and no one's looking like, let's, you know, whatever the other side, you know. Everyone wants to work together. And, uh, and I think that's what it's going to bring together out of this crisis moment. This is one of those moments where we come together as Americans, we put aside our differences, and, uh, you know, Pearl Harbor, 9-11, you look at all these different moments where we crashed, and that's when we found our legs again to be American people to each other and help each other and boost each other. And that's what we're seeing right now. And so uh, hopefully we'll see more of that. And that's what helps gets us to the other side. That's right. So uh, thanks, Monis, for tuning in. Be sure to watch. We're going to be profiling many more uh, politicians coming up or people running for office as well uh, coming up uh, through November 2020. Make sure you uh, order early. I, I always vote an absentee ballot. And one of the reasons I do is I get my ballot earlier. And then I Google down the list and, and you'd be surprised. The bottom part is more important because all politics are local. I mean, everybody knows who's running for office at federal level, but really it's those people that are going to make the difference in your lives at the local level. So I love to go through, I Google it. I plan out how I'm going to vote. I send them my vote. I get to take time. I get frustrated if I go see the line, but this year I think we're going to have a whole lot more mail in voting, which needs to happen. So people don't get the disease and die. I mean, I, I realize voting is important to people who have died for that right in world wars, but uh, we don't need to have any more of it than we need to. So be sure to go to theresistance.com. You'll see more of those interviews if you're in Utah. Uh, we have on Friday the lieutenant governor candidate for the state of Utah for the Democratic Party. Uh, she's going to be on. Uh, you can see our interview with uh, Chris Peterson. He was really awesome. And some of the other people that are around Utah we have planned out, mapped out appointments over the next month or two. So thanks, my audience, for tuning in. You can also see portions of these shows on the Chris Foss Show, chrisfosspodcast.com. And, uh, and uh, of course, you can go to uh, thecvpn.com, youtube.com, forward slash Chris Foss. Subscribe to all nine podcasts over there. Thanks, my audience, for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.